Uh, thank you very much to Bikant uh, Turkish Literature Department for inviting me here. So this is based on my PhD research. I completed it in 2017 and it was defended in 2018. So it is fresh out of the oven, if you like. And this will be the first time I will be presenting it in Turkey, or at least this part of it in Turkey. And uh, my aim today is perhaps uh, seducing into some of the MA students here into perhaps studying uh, medical humanities in the future and perhaps trigger some sort of conversation about the possibilities of Turkish literature in relation to medical humanities. Um, and also I would like to thank to Peter for inviting me as well. Um, so, right, so in 1853, the British ambassador to St. Petersburg, Sir G. H. Seymour, reported that Char Nicholas I defined the Ottoman Empire as a man, I quote, who has fallen into a state of disruptitude. His words were transformed into the now famous phrase, the sick man of Europe, and thus the Ottoman Empire was characterized as a disrupt and decaying power on the fringes of Europe in Western political caricatures and discourses of the time. Following the decline of the Ottoman Empire, the newly founded Turkish Republic defined itself as a young and progressive nation state, as opposed to the portrayal of the Ottoman Empire as old, sick and conservative. The new Turkey, indeed, the new Turkey indeed had clear-cut definitions on who an ideal Turkish citizen was. According to the official speeches in the government and publications by the founding members, the ideal Turkish citizen, among many things, was also healthy and fit. Remaining healthy and taking care of one's body were defined as the primary duties of every citizen. Such expectations took different courses in different genders. Women especially had to make sure that they were healthy since they were expected to give birth to and raise healthy, uh, and raise healthy young generations. For instance, in a weekly newspaper called Yeni Adam, New Man, in 1937, Ismail Hakkı Baltacıoğlu uh, explained the role of women as follows, I quote, the new woman also brings about the idea of a new body not a coquettish, fragile, sickly beauty, but a strong, healthy, athletic, fresh beauty that is indicative of success. Looking at a period of transition when every individual life was approached as potentially allegorical, then I ask simply, what about unhealthy bodies? Does being sick mean failing as a citizen? In this talk, I will argue that if health and fitness were preconditions of becoming ideal citizens, images of illness and sick bodies were inevitably pushed to the margins of nationhood, and ironically included in the discourse through their exclusion. I have to make clear, however, we are then discussing not material corporeal unhealthiness, that is, diseases themselves, but how they become part of a discourse how they have been imagined and narrativized. And the moment biological and neurological diseases are narrativized and become part of imagination, they are transformed into constructed discourses of illness. One work that we are all familiar with on this subject is Susan Sontag's illness, uh, illness as Metaphor and AIDS and its Metaphors. Here, Sontag discusses various ways in which tuberculosis, cancer, and AIDS are described and narrativized. She points to how both cancer and tuberculosis were, or are, imagined to be, among many things, as diseases of passion, caused by feeling too much, having uncontrollable desires, and being oversensitive. She looks at phases of capitalism as one of the determinants of these metaphors and myths around these illnesses. Tuberculosis, as a disease of early capitalism, indicates refusal to spend, while cancer, as a, discourse, uh, as a disease of late capitalism, indicates irrational growth and spending. She discusses war metaphors as some of the most popular ways of narrativizing diseases. We can add up many examples, but let's begin with war against cancer, fighting back, the illness attacks. In this work, she criticizes our tendency to use metaphors when describing illnesses and argues, I quote, illness is not a metaphor, and that the most truthful way of regarding illness, and the healthiest way of being ill, is one most purified of, most resistant to metaphoric thinking. However, it is almost inevit inevitable to avoid metaphors while discussing illness or physical pain, since we have to make use of language as our tool. 
As Clark Lovler points out in his Consumption and Literature, The Making of the Romantic Disease, I quote, narrative is a tool to demonstrate how mythologies of illness arise partly because humans must exp explain disease through patterns of language. And these narratives are able to transcend or transform the physical world, even that of our own bodies. If we are approaching illnesses as forms of narratives, made up of representations and metaphors, we should discuss the ideology behind such narratives. The literary representations of illnesses also functions, sorry, also, um, where am I? Uh, we should discuss the ideology behind such narratives. The literary representations of illnesses also function as what Foucault calls regulative ideals, and through these, the subject is created or regulated in the image of ideology. Indeed, in his chapter entitled Sickness as Meaning in Origins of Japanese Literature, Kojin Karatani disagrees with Sontag and defines medicine as, I quote, agent of modernization, one whose power is beyond any other. He notes, in the case of Japan, I quote, medicine is all of Western science, as well as being science. It is totally political, constituting one form of centralized power. Karatani argues that it is impossible to strip illness from meaning, since, regardless of the individual's bodily experiences of it, illness exists in society, I quote, as the effect of a certain typological schema, a semiological system, unquote. Looking at, uh, looking at it as an engineered narrative, he goes on to look at the effects of Dutch medicine, I quote, the only form of Western learning that was sanctioned by the Edo government in Japan, and notes, I quote, more than in any other area, it has been in modern medicine that knowledge has effectively constituted power. And that, I quote, the structure of medical science promoted an opposition between illness and health. I would like to argue that this is also the case for, uh, for the example of Turkey. Looking at the history of modernization since the 19th century, we find that medicine functioning as one of the most powerful agents of regulation. Giving the detailed historical account of this is beyond the scope of this talk and also my research, but I believe a brief look at some of the cornerstones in the uh, 19th century will help us contact the dots more easily. Not surprisingly, preventive medicine and centralizing the health service became issues to consider for the Ottoman Empire just before it went through a period of vast modernization through Tanzimat reforms. The Ottoman retreat in military terms led Sultan uh, Selim III to pay particular attention to the health and fitness of the Ottoman soldiers and as a result to found the first state hospital in 1806. This was followed by the first utilization of quarantines under the rule of Sultan Mehmed II. It was not only the health, but also the birth and death of subjects in the empire had become an issue that the Ottoman administration began to concern itself with. Between 1829 and 1836, the population census and the registration of births and deaths were regulated. From 1827 onwards, the Ottoman Empire systematized its control over abortions with decrees that banned the acts or penalized those who assisted abortion. In 1840, Mejlisi Tibbiye, a medical council, was founded to regulate medical products. By the turn of the century, worries over syphilis had led the publication of books, both in translation and originally written in Ottoman Turkish, to be distributed to warn the public about the dangers of the disease, with writers such as Ahmet Mithat, Abdul Hakk Mehmet Tahir, or Melikzade Fuat, strongly arguing that full health checks should now be preconditions of marriages. In other words, worries over diseases developed alongside concerns regarding the structure and system of the Ottoman Empire. The opinions on the need for the spread of a scientific and positivist worldview to create a new Ottoman society also began to gain popularity in the second half of the 19th century among many Ottoman intellectuals, especially in relation to the Tanzimat reforms. German materialist Ludwig Buchner, French physiologist Claude Bernard, and later English naturalist and um, geologist uh, Charles Darwin, among many others, became influential, influential names and were often cited to explain society in light of science and positivism. Medicine functioned as one of the key areas where these new epistemological notions were introduced and applied.
However, transforming Western concepts into Ottoman Turkish with the Arabic alphabet often proved to be too hard a task, since the latter did not possess terminology that could introduce many concepts of positivist epistemology. As a result, in military and medical schools, um, of the official language was French. Pupils had to be guided in French, and the official textbooks were in French. An infatuation with materialism and positivism led many Ottoman students, thinkers and writers to act as social engineer, engineers. So much so that one of the prominent and controversial names of Ottoman materialism, Dr. Abdullah Cevdet, was indeed one of the five founder members of the nucleus of the Society of Union and Progress at the Royal Medical Academy of all places in 1889. It is therefore not a coincidence that the seeds of the Society of Union and Progress were first planted in the medical school. The first members were the students of Mehmet Shakir Pasha, a professor at the Royal Medical Academy, and a former student of the physiologist and the great inspiration behind Emil Zola's naturalism, Claude Bernard. Hence, determinism, social Darwinism, and heredity played central roles in the political climate of the 19th century and early 20th century in the Ottoman Empire, in line with its European contemporaries such as France or United Kingdom. In her PhD thesis entitled Body, Disease, and Late Ottoman Literature, Debates on Ottoman Muslim Family in the Tanzima Period, Tuba Demirci, which I believe she, uh, who I believe wrote her PhD thesis here at Bilkent, uh, notes it is in this period with the introduction of population policies and the institutionalization of public health that the, I quote, masses, inhabitants, subjects, quite often denoted by the famous Ottoman word ahali, were turned into population with its all technical, social and political connotation. After the foundation of the Republic, investment in the bodies of the population continued to be directly influenced by the Western European examples. Eugenics began to play an important, if omnious, omnious role in definitions of who an ideal Turkish citizen was. Medical science was used to promote key issues. It placed ancient Turks into the history of civilization, thereby boosted nationalist pride in the masses. It proved biological connections between the Turkish race and Europeans, and hence created an organic bond between Turkey and the West. It ensured a healthy labor and military force in the coming generations by presenting health not as a personal, but as a collective responsibility. And it disciplined the population during civilizing reforms. The central position of the medical authorities in the government points to the role of health politics played in the formation of the nationalist discourse. In Biometrics and Anthropometrics, the Twins of Turkish Modernity, Murat Ergin writes, I quote, the lack of research on Republican biometrics hinges on the assumption that its proponents were simply a group of eccentric, if not mad scientists, clearly outside the scientific and political mainstream. This, however, does not reflect the historical, uh, historical reality since, I quote, scholars of biometrics occupied respectable positions because biometrics translated global scientific trends into locally usable uh, forms. For instance, Mendelian genetics, especially concerning the hereditary laws on mixed races, as argued in Gregor Mendel's experiments in plant hybridization, inspired the works of Masar Osman, Shevket Aziz Kanso, and Sarah Aktik, three of the most respected scientists of their time in planning the welfare of the future generations. Perihan Chambal, Chambal and Saadi Urmak utilized Francis Galton and Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's ideas to scientifically support the hereditary qualities of the Turkish nation, as well as to use genetics as a determinant while regulating population. While scientists used this research to justify the natural capacity of the Turkish people to be modern, some of these scientists also held important positions in the parliament, allowing them to enact laws in accordance with the results of their research. Among these scientists, uh, scientist MPs, there were Cemil Topuzlu, uh, two-time mayor of Istanbul and the surgeon both nationally and internationally known, and Fahrettin Kerim, Kerim Gökay, the mayor and governor of Istanbul, among uh, of his other, many other roles. Alongside research undertaken by Türk Tarihi Tetkik Cemiyeti, um, Society for the Study of Turkish History, and Türk Dili Tetkik Cemiyeti, Society for the Study of Turkish Language, medical research developed the myth of the Turk as a role model for every citizen. 
a strong, sturdy, a sturdy disciplined, educated, hard-working citizen who believed in the ideology of the Republic and who was willing to work for and dedicate their life to the well-being of the nation. The idealized image of the Turk was the future of the nation as well as the forgotten past. This was one of the main differences between the ideologies of the Ottoman Empire and that of the Turkish Republic. As Erik Jan Zuhrer notes, I quote, 19th century Ottomans certainly did not see themselves as part of the prehistoric pre phase of any Turkish Republic, unquote. In other words, science functioned as the justifying force behind the reforms enacted by the government in inventing the ancient and racial characteristic of the Turk, which would ensure closer ties with Western Europe and create ideological distance from its Ottoman past. For instance, Shevket Aziz Kansu set out to, to do research to prove the connection between Turkish and European races. Kansu investigated the physical character characteristics of 2,486 children, after which he came to the conclusion that Turks were connected to the Caucasian race. Saadi Irmak, who was an academic in the Faculty of Medicine in Istanbul University, Prime Minister from 1974 to 1975, and was part of the group that prepared a new constitution in 1980, prepared a research on blood types and fingerprints of Turkish people. He presented the results uh, at the Turkish History Congress of 1937, and his research was published by the State of Turkey Press, Devlet Matbaasa. It concluded that, I quote, the Turkish race differed from Eastern and Southern Asian nations and showed resemblance to European nations. In a period in which Western Europe defined white Caucasian race as superior, Highlighting the fundamental role the prehistoric Turks played in founding civilizations provided the Turkish gov government with immunity from such discourse. The duty of the members of the new Turkish nation was to remember and cultivate their inner great Turk, whose characteristics were already in their blood. This is exemplified in the work undertaken by Sarah Aktik, who wrote in her research entitled The Biological, Economical and National Importance of the Study of Genetics that even though during the last period of the Ottoman Empire people had forgotten their true nature, Turkish people could still remember and know their hereditary qualities thanks to the science of genetics. In a speech with athletes, um, athletes in 1926, uh, Atatürk asserted that, I quote, the bad effects of the past have remained in the Turkish race, and as a result, I quote, our contemporary generation has found the Turkish race to be weak, sick, and sickly. In another speech, he remarked, I quote, I want robust and vigorous generations. Um, I thought this visual would be appropriate given that I am in Ankara. Hence, healthiness and fitness were turned into measures for the members of the nation to size themselves up against, and they identified them as prerequisites for inclusion into the nation. The definitions of the generation, on the other hand, functioned in pointing to the ones who were left out of the borders of discursive nation. Mahsar Osman gave a lecture entitled Eugenics in 1939 at a conference organized by the government. The lecture was on the topic of producing high quality new generations. One of his suggestions was, uh, one of his suggestions for citizens was not to marry degenerates or anyone whose family tree reveals traces of degeneracy. His definition of uh, degenerates consisted of, I quote, the urban poor, as in prostitutes, alcoholics, young criminals, and beggars. This is, I'm directly quoting now, so this is not, these are not my words. The mentally ill, um, epileptics, and schizophrenics, and psychopaths, the rich who gained money either by inheritance or through other means, such as fraud. Unquote. One of the elements to uh, highlight here is how he grouped criminals and sick people together as degenerates or as untouchable bodies. According to Masar Osman, all these groups participated in hindering national progress. He defined degenerate people as parasites who could only live with the aid of other people, as opposed to healthy people who were the source of wealth for the progression of country. His lecture was later on published by the Devlet Matbaasa again. Eugenics was used as part of a solution to the financial problems of the country, with human power being regarded as the primary resource, which also meant that members of the nation were born with biological responsibilities. 
Accordingly, in the first National Medicine Congress in 1925, Prime Minister Ismet İnönü referred to a healthy man as the primary condition for the financial and social betterment of the country, as well as a guarantee for national defense. Similarly, the mayor of Istanbul, Fahrettin Kerim Gökay, remarked, remarked in 1934 that one for all, all for one, and suggested that, I quote, today an individual is the most income-generated source of capital. In his uh, research called The Issue of Eugenic and Sturdiness of Race. In, um, in 1930, Master Osman wrote that the increase of working healthy hands was positively correlated with wealth of the country. In 1941, he formulated the definition of a good citizen and wrote, I quote, a person proves, to be, proves that he is a good citizen by protecting his life, unquote. A professor at Istanbul University, Fahri Arar, gave a speech entitled Street Accidents as part of government's conference series in which he suggested that knowing what to do in the case of an accident held great importance since what use is a child to himself or to his country if he uses, loses his legs? He is doomed to live as a parasite on the back of society and society is doomed to feed him." Unquote. In Homo Sokers, Giorgio Agamben argues that Zoe, which expressed, I quote, the simple fact of living with common, um, the simple fact of living common to all living beings, animals, men, or gods, and bios, I quote, the form or way of living proper to an individual or a group, which were differentiated by ancient Greek philosophy, were combined at the threshold of the modern era. It is in his writing that we find the modern dilemma of the bios of Zoe, that relies strictly on the ban on bare life. He writes, there is politics because man is a living being who, in language, separates and opposes himself to his own bare life and at the same time maintains himself in relation to that bare life in an inclusive exclusion. From the very first moment in which a simple living, be a simple living body became what is at stake in a society's political strategies, the emphasis on such a living body has marked the flesh with political weight. In Eric Satney's words, the paradox at work here is, in short, that the defense mechanisms cultures use to protect against a primordial exposure to cover our nudity serve in the end to redouble this exposure and thereby to fatten the flesh of creaturely life. Looking at the 17th, century, 17th and 18th century in France, Sarah Melser and Catherine Norberg connect the idea of the fattened body to the transformation from monarchy to nationhood and argue that as power changed hands, the weight on the flesh of the monarch was carried to the bodies of the people. They write, I quote, suddenly everybody bore political weight, unquote. The fattening of people's bodies, as Satner argues, does not manage to, I quote, get rid of the problem of the carnal or corporeal dimension of representation, unquote. I argue that failing to fulfill the predicaments of a docile body, which in Foucault's words is manipulated, shaped and trained, the sick body functions as the persistent reminder of the ban. At the end of his first volume on Homo Sacer, Agamben summarizes thesis in these arguments. I will focus on the first two as they best help to move, uh, move my argument forward. His thesis, his first thesis goes as follows. I quote, the original political relation is the ban the state of exception as zone of indistinction between outside and inside, exclusion and inclusion. I would like to place his argument on state power into the private sphere of individuation and suggest that the ban is a form of objection. In her Powers of Horror, an essay on objection, Julia Kristeva defines the object as something that is neither object nor subject, including but also excluding both. The in-between position of the object disturbs the borders of subjectivity and culture by threatening the integrity of the subjection that is necessary for the formation of identity. Belonging to both, the object threatens to destroy such dualities of the speaking subject, as she argues, it takes the ego back to its source on the abominable limits from which, in order to be, the ego has broken away. It assigns it as source in the non-ego, drive and death. According to Kristeva, crime is also a type of object since it reminds us of the fragility of the law, of the lines that the subject has drawn to preserve its wholeness. It is thus not lack of cleanliness or health that causes objection, she notes, but what disturbs identity system order, what does not respect borders, positions, rules. Like the subject, the imagination suffers from the same threat against its borders, and the ban is a defense mechanism against the destruction of the system and borders. 
Agamben's second thesis goes as follows. The fundamental activity of sovereign power is the production of bare life as originary political element and as a threshold of articulation between nature, culture, zoe, and bios. The second thesis implies that Western politics is a biopolitics from the very beginning and that every attempt to found political liberties in the right of the citizen is therefore in vain. In other words, bare life or pure life lies at the center of the modern Western politics through exclusion. With its capacity to be unwell, therefore, the material body functions as a reminder of the ban, as its object. The borders of the nation relies on what is left outside of it. Now, looking at works of literature with this in mind has the potential to reveal the cracks in the imagined borders of the nation, as Turkish language, language literature was never shy about instrumentalizing health and illness. As David Simpson argues, I quote, literature both reproduces and reformulates ideology, and in its re uh, reformulations, it becomes implicitly a vanguard element. In uh, Babalar ve Oğullar, Fathers and Sons, Jale Parla likens the renovations of in the Tanzimat period to a mold fit. And note, I quote, the mold, however, was supposed to hold two different epistemologies that rested on irre irreconcilable axioms, and as a result, it was inevitable that this mold would crack and literature, in one way or another, reflects the cracks. Now, I would like to focus on two works here to reveal how the healthy body of ideal citizen clashes with the persistent vulnerability of the material body. One of them is Haldedip Adıvar's Meyvu Tüküm, Promised Verdict, a novel published in 1917. Haldedip dedicated to the soul of Emil, I quote, to the soul of Emil Zola. Haldedip often made use of the tropes of health and sickness in her works. However, the sickly protagonists of her early works become exceptionally healthy and fit in her later ones. The ideology about healthy members of the healthy nation is at work on the road between her sickly protagonist, Handan, to the most accomplished swimmer of the village, Lale of Tatarcık. Mehmet Hüküm, on the other hand, is a work which reveals her own questioning about heredity as a way to look at society. On the one hand, she sets out to write a determinist novel, obvious right from the beginning when she dedicates the work to Emil Zola. However, she almost localizes determinism when she adds her own spirituality into the formula. I will argue that the mold fit that is supposed to hold two axioms leads to a combination of two genres, naturalism and tragedy in Haldedip's Mevtukum. Emil Zola, the champion of naturalism, had already become an object of confusion among Ottoman intellectuals by then. Referred to as the first Ottoman naturalist, Beşir Fuat himself, championed Claude Bernard's experimental medicine along with Zola's naturalism. Yet, Zola's definition of writers as experimental scientists and his choices of topic were criticized by many other prominent writers of the period, like Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Mithat Efendi or Halit Ziya Mushaklıgil. Ahmed Mithat uh, criticized Zola's subject materials in his essay, Emil Zola'yı okumuyorum. Why don't I read Emil Zola? Mushaklıgil, on the other hand, asked in his Hikaye story, I quote, the Goncourts are also realists, but in spite of this, their work is not filthy. There is filth in Zola. Why? Well, why indeed? Hence, it can be concluded that while, in Ottoman, while the Ottoman writers of the late 19th century were fascinated with the idea of determinism as a powerful new way of understanding society, Zola's novels and his topics functioned as barriers, one that would lead the way to determinist thought, but exceeding the barrier of filth was regarded as highly dangerous and morally corrupt. Haldedip first discovered Zola in 1901, according to her memoirs. Her memoir is full of comments on her struggle with Zola. She defines him as, I quote, the most powerful educator of my soul. She also defines him as an idealist who attacked man's vices, I quote, exaggerating into absolute folly the sexual ones, unquote. Zola, on the other hand, definitely did not see himself as an idealist. He, in fact, criticized idealism in his own essay um, entitled The Experimental Novel published in 1880. In this work, where he theorizes his naturalism, he condemns idealists for being entrapped in themselves in search of truth and describes himself instead as a man of science 
a magistrate who has the capacity to enlighten science about the motivations of human behavior through what he calls experimental novels. He writes, I quote, it is scientific investigation, it is experimental reasoning, which combats one, uh, one by one the hypothesis of the idealists, and which replaces purely imaginary novels by novels of observation and experiment, unquote. Haldedip's notes on Zola, however, are powerful examples of spiritual appropriation of determinism. In her memoir, memoir, she writes, I quote, Zola lighted up proportions of the human soul with his fastidious and very French idealism. He chastised men by making grotesque statues and pictures of their violence, unquote. Such sexual desire was accordingly stopping mankind from reaching a higher level for she suggests, I quote, Zola evidently told that the sexual perversions were fundamental, fundamental ones in man's character, and that unless he were made sane and normal in that respect, he could not reach higher levels, unquote. What she means by higher level, however, does not have determinist connotations, but rather she points to a purification of the soul in order to unite with the divine power. I quote, Zola's test is the hardest test for sincere and piously inclined souls. But if they can come out of it, whole nothing afterward can change their belief in the existence of a divine power." Unquote. What then was this test again? She writes, I always identify Zola with a picture of Christ chasing the moneylenders from the temple. I do not remember whose the picture is, but in it, Christ has the unrelenting eyes of a destroyer, full of a holy horror, such horror as Pasteur would have had in his eyes if he had seen a tube of microbes of some terrible sort getting loose in a human dwelling." Unquote. Here, I will argue that Haldedip's formulation of Zola and her combination of materialism and spirituality is achieved in her novel, Mevutukum, through combining two genres that point to two different worldviews, naturalism and tragedy which, I argue, is a representative of the Ottoman's response to an appropriation of Western post positivism. The discourse on deterministic progression of society is both affirmed and undermined as the novel is transformed from a naturalist text to an altered adaptation of William Shakespeare's Othello. The heroine, Sarah, who suffers from a venereal disease and hereditary madness, does not die of her illness, but rather is killed by her doctor husband, Kazim Shinasi, who falsely believes that she is having an affair. Despite her poor hereditary qualities and venereal disease, Sarah still manages to rise above the filth with all her gracefulness intact. Her husband, however, despite all his normative social stance as a doctor, whose mission becomes the healing the society, cannot manage to rise from the filth in his soul and kills his wife. In the end, the novel follows the deterministic rules by killing Sarah, but also questions them by also portraying the tragic fall of the scientific mind. The first half of the novel not only port portrays a scientific mind in the image of the protagonist Kasim Shinasi, but also implied narrator follows a scientific, purely observant style by not interfering in the story and allowing the doctor protagonist to judge, magistrate, and measure the ills of society through his scientific knowledge. For instance, in the opening chapter, when he sees his uncle's wife, Behire, for the first time upon his return from Europe, where he received his medical education, he observes that she is a woman of young and pretty facial features with one exception, her tired-looking eyes with under-eye bags. Kalsam looks for signs of a disease in the features of this woman. When he notices the same tired expression in her lips, he exclaims, a hysterical woman. Kasim Shinasi, who is very scientific while observing society, is not, however, so successful when it comes to his personal relationships. Whereas the narrator never leaves any gaps in its authority, it focalizes on other characters' minds when Kasim fails to read them. This, this forms a direct relationship between Haldedip's Mevutukum and Emil Zola's notion of the experimental novel. In line with Zola's novel theory, um, the narrative of Mevutukum sets out an experiment. It borrows its observatory attitude from its protagonist, Kasim Shinasi. Yet, soon enough, we begin to realize that Kasim Shinasi is not the observant he thinks he is, but is instead the object of observation. He is portrayed as an objective and scientific mind without any social skills. He observes people's behaviors as if they are, I quote, microbes blending in glass cartridges, end of quote. 
He is not, however, an active agent himself. The narrator assures us, I quote, even though he is a healthy man, a gentleman from birth, he chooses to observe the attraction between men and women, not wanting to participate in such relationships. I quote, since his imagination left him uninterested about the parts of humans apart from their flesh, blood and bones, he neither spotted a desirable attraction nor did he notice any detestable lie, treachery or vanity in women, unquote. However, the real experiment, and hence the novel itself, begins when Kalsim Shinasi leaves his laboratory and joins society as an active agent. This is the experiment the plot puts into action. Is it possible to remain objective and rational against one's own desires and in the midst of contingencies? Although this is a test that Hadeda formulates for her protagonist in the light of her understanding of Zola, she moves beyond Zola by making Zola's experimental man the subject of her own experiment. The, the deterministic characteristic of the novel is also evident in its title. Sarah, a syphilitic woman with madness in her hereditary line, asks Kalsem Shinasi to kill her if he suspects that syphilis or madness makes her lose consciousness. Therefore, Mevutukum, meaning promised verdict, not only points to the promise that Sarah forces Kalsim to give, which is that if she goes mad like her mother, Kalsim will kill her. It also points to her hereditary traits. Sarah, from the moment of her birth, is doomed. The madness of her mother marks her as one of the undesirables in society. She is not, um, perhaps you can also uh, see the similarities between this work and Zola's Nana as well. Um, she is not only born with a deficiency in her blood, she also passes these qualities to her own daughter. The plot puts these two char opposite characters, Kalsim and Sarah, together almost in an experimental attitude to observe the results of this union, which reveals a tension between spirituality and materialism. In 1912, during the Balkan Wars, Kalsim Shinazi decides to join the war to serve as a doctor. However, his time away is consumed by his blinding jealousy. While Kalsim Shinasi loses his ideal position more every day, Sarah, on the other hand, refrains herself from following the call of the flesh. She loyally waits for Kalsim's return and devotes herself to the well-being of society by nursing in a dispensary. Sarah is about to pass Hadedib's test indeed, while Kalsim Shinasi is about to fail. When Behie, fulfilling the role of um, Iago, Otello's Iago, sends Sarah's piece of hair and handkerchief as a proof of Sarah's disloyalty to Kalsim Shinasi, Sarah does not die as a villain, but as a victim. Kalsim Shinasi takes Sarah's disloyalty as a sign of her hereditary madness and decides to kill her to save her from herself. Possessed by jealousy, he sentences her to death by rationalizing his decision through scientific thinking. In 1913, on the night when the people of the city are out celebrating the young Turks' victory of taking the city of Edirnebek, Kalsim Shinasi injects morphine into Sarah's blood. The text does not kill the heroine and celebrate the dismissal of the burden of society, but rather mourns for her victimhood. The uneasiness between the two axioms turns nationalism into tragedy. While Halde Edip appropriates determinism and social Darwinism through a literary form, a writer who has been left outside the limits of the canon took such ideology and turned it into the subject of a melodrama. In 1938, only 15 years after the foundation of the modern republic, a young writer called Kerime Nadir, um, or as um, Selim Ileri defines her, um, Queen of Tuberculosis novels, um, Verem Romanları Kraliçesi, no, what was the um, term? Doesn't remember. Uh, Verem Kraliçesi, Veremler Kraliçesi. Um, she published a novel about the tragic love story between tubercular Nala and a young soldier, Kenan. The novel was titled Hışkırık, Sobbing, meaning, uh, meaning sobbing, and it immediately became a bestseller, causing the following generations naming their children after the characters of the novel. I would like to argue that behind the popularity of this melodrama, there lies the eugenicist early Republican ideology. Um, obviously, this is, has nothing to do with novel, but I just love this adaptation of the novel by um, Orhan Aksoy, hence I have put some images from the movie. Um, Hüçkürük Sobin is also a Bildungsroman as much as it is a love story. Kenan, an orphan, 
is adopted by Nalam's father when he is six years old and the narrative follows his growth. Franco Moretti suggests that the process of normalization defines the main characteristics of Bildungsroman. As Madame Güller writes, Moretti's sense of normalization is very much in line with Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, according to which, I quote, individual consciousness is involved in a process of building, formation, education, with the goal of attaining knowledge of itself, not as an I, but as a V, that is to say, as part of a collective identity. Unquote. For Moretti, the normalization of a hero is where the hero does not only obey the social norms, but thoroughly internalizes them. Moretti calls this comfort of civilization. Bildungsroman is one of the closest meeting points of the private and the social. The growth of the hero, according to a given timeline, fits within the progressive ideology of modernity and presents the hero as a symbol of a modern man. In his unseasonable youth, Jed Etsy touches on what is left undiscovered in Moretti's formulation in The Way of the World, the symbolic function of nationhood. I quote, the discourse on nationhood supplies the realist building roman with an emergent language of historical continuity or social identity amid the rapid and sweeping changes of industrialization, I unquote. It is therefore highly significant that in 1938, in the heyday of the Turkish Republic's ideology of progression, Kerim Nadir chose to write about becoming of a hero. What we have as a result is an image of a man growing in national historical time. After finding out, uh, after finding out that, now going back to the novel, after finding out that his father on paper is not his biological uh, father, he is adopted by a man and is brought to his mansion in Istanbul. This man also has a daughter called Nalan, a few years older than Kenan. The daughter is portrayed as a highly energetic but sensitive child who enjoys European style music, plays piano and speaks French, but to her father's concern, is also interested in Ottoman style music and culture. She secretly goes to a mixed gender European style party, but she also secretly goes to a traditional Ottoman lute player's house to listen to his music. In the scene where Kenan and Nalan first meet, the power hierarchy in their relationship is established immediately. Feeling shy in front of Nalan's friends, Kenan hides himself behind Nalan's skirt. Nalan, Nalan directly adopts the role of an older sister as well as a mother replacement, and the two grow up as siblings. Kenan's brotherly, or rather son-like love for Nalan turns into a romantic one as they become teenagers. However, no matter how many years pass, Nailan still defines Kenan as childish and immature. To paraphrase Homi Baba, Kenan is almost a man, but not quite. In the introduction or to the new edition of the novel, uh, Selim Ileri, notes that he always reads uh, Hüçkürük as a story of Kenan's repressed sexuality. Accordingly, whenever he is at Nailan's side, Kenan describes his cheeks reddening, his heartbeats accelerating, and tells us that he feels like fainting. Putting his head onto her breast or onto her knees is a repeated action in their daily dynamics. He is at, a, at loss of words, and his sense of self whenever his, um, and he loses his sense of self whenever his head falls onto Nylan's chest. In his own words, a feeling of fainting has passed through me, as if I was falling from somewhere high. It was the first time I had put my head on Nylan's breasts for years. I was half conscious. My ears were listening to her heartbeats. As one grows up, the other uh, as one grows up and gains energy, however, the other loses it. Kenan step by step turns into a man as Nylan melts away with tuberculosis, coughing blood. While, um, while she defines Kenan's feelings as childish and Kenan as not yet a fully grown man, she defines herself as too unhealthy to unite with such a promising, healthy young man. Kenan's teenage love for her, however, does not cease, but rather turns into a sexual obsession as the years pass. His tantrums, caused by sexual frustration, gain power. He tries to rape her, but is stopped by Nala, Nalan's coughing and trembling. Kenan's masculine desire to consume Nylan is achieved by Nylan's consumptive disease. As Bram Dijkstra uh, puts in his Idols of Perversity, that becomes a woman's ultimate sacrifice of her being to the males she had been born to serve. 
that she must transfer the essence of her well-being, symbolically her jewel, the fragile lily of her virtue, to her chosen mate to help revivify his moral energies. The text is not very generous about dates, except two of them. One of them is the year that Nalan dies. Um, there are, I think, um, Kerime Nader and Halide Edip are a strange duo to think about together in one paper. However, I think there are many similarities between the two novels, and one of them is the dates. Nalan dies uh, in 1912 at the start of Balkan Wars as well, um, which obviously is a date that the coincidentally when the Ottoman Empire's hegemony ceased to exist due to the loss of the Balkan Wars. After, um, after Nalan's death in 1912, Kenan joins the independence war and finally returns to Istanbul in 1923 with the victorious Turkish troops who were ready to start a brand new country from the ashes of the diseased empire. Kenan, when he is back from the war, um, I just realized I actually don't have the printout of my last paper, so I will just spontaneously tell, conclude my work now. Um, he comes back, coincidentally, from the war in 1923, again, an interesting date, um, as part of the victorious troops. But this time when he comes back, victorious feeling as a grown-up man, this time he has proven his uh, hegemonic masculinity as well at the war. When he comes back, Nalan is dead. But uh, don't you worry, um, there is her exact copy waiting for her, Nalan's daughter. Um, if you remember these melodramas of Kerme Nader's novels, um, usually, um, um, oh, what's, her, what's the actor's name? Um, Hülya Kocit. Hülya Kocit's daughter is often um, also herself as well. So in the novel too, um, Handan, Nalan's daughter is defined as an exact copy of Nalan. <laughs> In fact, she says at one point, the only person who can heal your wounds, Kenan, is my mother in me. So, I believe we can argue about Hüçkürük, that I, I believe we can see the discourse around healthy new generations of the early Republican periods in Hüçkürük. Kenan, now as a fully grown man coming back from the war, cannot unite with Nalan anymore, but with Nalan's healthy uh, daughters, with whom they will obviously bring out babies and they will live to um, happy futures together. So, my, um, I had a very good conclusion, I promise, which has not been printed out, but I will say it now. So, I believe that it is, Turkish literature is, in, in, in a nutshell, Turkish literature is full of potential to reveal the cracks about the imagined nationhood in relation to health and illness. If we can argue that the imagined nation relies on the imagined borders about who should be included in the nation, then we cannot have this discussion without talking about who is excluded from it as well. And I believe, following Jale Parra's argument about the mold fit, the cracks are revealed in um, illness literature, in Turkish literature. I looked at in my thesis specifically on women writers and women's diseases, but I think the masculinity side of things is there and it's full of potentials about you know, what it means, men's illnesses, men's disabilities, what that means in relation to this official ideology is out there. And um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you very much for listening.